Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations that there's this strange thing going on in the colonies. They are issuing paper money. It can circulate and retain its value. The colonies knew what they were doing. They would authorize printing up Virginia notes. And at the same time, they would accept back the notes in payment of taxes. And then what did they do with the notes? They burned them all. They were not collecting tax revenue to get money to spend. Tax ensured that there would be a demand for the currency. So the answer to Smith's puzzle, why does it retain its value? Well, people needed to pay the tax. The U.S. can't run out of dollars. Now, what can we run out of? The same thing every country can run out of. Resources. Could the U.S. produce the real stuff that they need? And right now, the answer is pretty clear that we can. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, And I'm Patricia Pino. And we're honoured to be joined today by economist primary MMT academic and author of many key works, including the book that gave modern money theory its name. So we are utterly privileged to welcome back to the show, Professor L. Randall Ray. Hi, Randy. Hi, good to be on. So let's start with your recent book, which is called Making Money Work for Us. And congratulations on the book. It's such a great read and really accessible. But your first chapter heading is one of my favorite questions of all time, which is, what is money? Now, as someone who's been answering that question since the 1980s, as I read it, what is money? Well, first, all money is debt. So it's a credit-debt relation. Um, This is the approach that I think really comes out of history of money, the anthropology of money, the sociology of money, So really, every field that has studied money, I think, comes to this conclusion. It's just economists who had a very hard time understanding this. Gold is not money. Bitcoins are not money. It has to be a debt. And so we see bank money as a debt of the bank, currency as a debt of the government, reserves as the debt of central banks. And in the book, I say it's sort of nice to think of this. If you're holding currency, you are the creditor and the government is your debtor. And in the book, you draw a distinction between money and money things. Could you talk about that? Sure. That's actually from John Maynard Keynes, who made this distinction. So we can think of money as a measuring unit. What does it measure? Debts and credits. And so it's we're focusing on money as a unit of account. And so in a way, it's like the inch or centimeter. That is a measuring unit. And money is a measuring unit of debts and credit. By money thing, what Keynes meant was, how do we keep a record of that debt or credit? We don't want to rely on memories. We want to write it down. And so over time, we use a wide variety of technologies to record the debts, such as clay tablets, wooden tally sticks, metal coins, 
and paper money. So a wide variety of ways of recording it. Today, it's mostly electronic entries. That is the money thing, the way that we keep track. Well, the fact that we have a lot of definitions of money and very often across like kind of the economics texts, they have this quantity of money theory of inflation and they often struggle with identifying what the M in that equation is. And over time, I think it's got expanded into first, it was just the most liquid money. And then it got expanded into things that could be easily converted into money. And recently, MMT also talks about government bonds as being a type of money. How would you go about addressing that? It, why is it so controversial to add the notion of government bonds as money to today's economic kind of theories? Okay, well, typically, the orthodox approach begins with the functions of money. So money is what money does. And the things that satisfy those functions have changed over time, and they recognize that. And so that's what creates a problem for them, because they're focusing on the functions of money, whereas we are saying that what is most important is that money is a record of indebtedness, and it doesn't matter what technology we use, if it's a measure of indebtedness of indebtedness, and then it's money. We can think of three dimensions of the money things that we're talking about. That is the money records. One is liquidity. The second is transferability. And the third is yield. And liquidity means how quickly could you change that money record to the government's currency. And if we talk about checking deposits, which are called demand deposits by economists, that word demand tells you something, you can convert them on demand really, really quickly. Okay, today, as fast as you can get to that ATM machine, you can convert it to cash. And at least at your own bank in the United States, there's no cost to doing this. Okay, so that's very liquid. If we talk about transferability, that means can you transfer it to someone else? And of course, that's very easy to do with cash that can be passed hand to hand. And you can write checks on your bank account. And so we can say that bank deposits are easily transferable. And then finally, there is the yield, which is the interest you can get. You get zero on cash. You can get maybe a little bit on your demand deposit, a little bit more on a savings deposit. So anyway, the things that are the most liquid, the most transferable, and have the lowest yield are the ones that I would want to call money. And there's some arbitrariness in this of necessity because we're talking about three different characteristics and we're talking about the degree of each one of those. We can think of a money pyramid where at the very top of that pyramid, we've got the government's currency and we probably also want to put the central bank's reserves, which are just deposits that private banks hold at the central bank. That's at the very top of the pyramid. And then a bit below that, we've got bank checking deposits. A little bit further down, we've got bank savings deposits and other kinds of time deposits. And then we have other kinds of financial institutions, such as money market mutual funds, are probably a bit lower in the period and on down until we get to the government bonds, why, which are easy to sell, but you could take a loss, a capital loss, depending on which way interest rates have gone. I don't want to get too much into financial theory, but it's possible that you could take a bit of a loss when you sell your government bonds and then corporate bonds and so on. So it is somewhat arbitrary where we draw that dividing line with the government bonds, if you hold it to maturity, you will always get face value. Does that factor into the three dimensions of money? I'm talking about if you, for some reason, you needed to sell it, you needed some cash, then you don't necessarily get what you paid. So it's not that the government's going to default or anything like that. It's just that interest rates can move and depending on the term to maturity, that can have a bigger effect on the price you could get at a point in time. You can always hold it to maturity and get what is promised and get interest in the meantime. Yes. Okay, so anyway, it's somewhat 
arbitrary. I wouldn't include bonds as money because there's the possibility of capital loss and it takes a bit of effort to convert them to cash. I was just wondering what implications that had for the notion that that money is exogenous or not, whether if we say that, that we do have control over the quantity of bonds against the quantity of reserves, and are we saying that we have some exogenous control over the money supply or, or not? Well, it depends on the central bank's goals. If the goal of the central bank is to hit interest rate targets, which they all admit is what they're trying to do now, and if the goal of the central bank is to have the payment system operate very smoothly so that checks clear, so that banks can clear accounts with other banks, then the central bank is not able to control the quantity of reserves at all. Even though reserves are their liability, and, you, and in the old days, economists used to think that, well, it's their liability, they could choose not to issue a a liability. But that's actually not true because central banks do care about impacts on interest rates and they do care. In fact, probably their overriding concern is always to have a smoothly function payment system where checks don't bounce. I mean, I'm talking about as long as they're good checks. <laughs> they want to make sure that the checks clear they always want to make sure that treasury checks clear. That's the most important one. And that means they will have to supply reserves as necessary to allow the clearing to take place. And that in turn means that they actually don't have control over it. The term exogenous has several different meanings. So one of those meanings is just simply outside the private market economy. And in that sense, yeah, we would say that the central bank is outside that private market economy. And so it's exogenous in that sense. So turning to taxes and taxation, in the book, you write, quote, keep this in mind, taxes are for redemption, not revenue. What does redemption mean in this context? Yeah, well, redemption means that you are returning an IOU to the issuer. And this, I would say, is a fundamental law. This is what A. Mitchell Ennis claimed, a fundamental law of all debt. And that is that the issuer of a debt must take a back end payment. And if you owe somebody, if you can get their debt, you can get yourself out of debt to them by delivering back to them their own IOU. And so when we're talking about the government, if you have a tax that you owe to the government, you can get yourself out of tax debt by getting hold of the government's debt, namely currency, and delivering that back to the government. If we go back to the American colonies, they were the, the first big issuers of paper money in the West. The Chinese had been doing it for hundreds of years before. But in the West, it was a new thing. It was even noticed by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He said, there's this strange thing going on in the colonies. They are issuing paper money. And even if they don't promise to redeem it for gold, it can circulate and retain its value. And the colonies knew what they were doing. They would authorize printing up, say, 10,000 pounds of Virginia notes in the case of the colony Virginia. And at the same time, they would pass a new tax law that they called redemption taxes that were expected to raise about 10,000 pounds. They would accept back the notes in redemption, that is payment of taxes. And so they got back the paper notes in tax revenue. And then what did they do with the notes? They burned them all, which makes it very clear they were not collecting tax revenue to get money to spend. They were collecting tax revenue to get money to burn. Now, why were they doing that? Tax ensured that there would be a demand for the currency and taking the currency out of the economy ensured that it wouldn't stay in the economy and possibly cause inflation. And so that was the answer to Smith's puzzle 
Why does it retain its value? Well, people need it to pay the tax. And once they've paid the tax, they burn it. So it can't cause the value of the currency to go down. Speaking of debts and redemption, also in your book, because this is the first time I've come across this, I have to ask, what is the Saudi principle? Okay. So Saudi was a scientist, but he came up with this argument that interest trumps growth. And so if you think about it, debts that promise to pay interest grow at the rate of interest. So if you borrow $100 and you promise to pay 10% interest, your debt is going to grow at a rate of 10%. It's going to get 10% bigger every year. Now, actually more than that if it's compounded frequently. Okay. And his argument was, if you look back in time, say in Babylonia, for example, where we have the first records of written records of debt, and we know a fair amount about their monetary system, the interest rate was, say, 20%. Now, we know that ancient societies grew extremely slowly, so slowly that you really wouldn't notice any economic growth over your lifetime. It's only the last few hundred years where growth is rapid enough that you actually can see it and notice it. And that's basically when the whole field of economics was founded. It was founded once economies grew fast enough that you could see it. But anyway, going back to his argument, with an, an, a high interest rate and an extremely low growth rate, it's very obvious that debts are going to grow much faster than the ability to make the payments. And that's exactly what happened. And that is why ancient societies always had a principle of debt cancellation in the year of Jubilee. Michael Hudson has written a lot about this. And the purpose of that was to essentially restart time, cancel the debts to restore. They were thinking what we're doing is restoring the natural order of things because we recognize it's not possible to pay the debts. Now, in more recent times, when our economy is doing well, we probably do grow faster than the interest rate, but often we don't. And what that means is the debts are going to grow faster than GDP, which is our measure of economic output. But even when GDP in the aggregate is growing faster, for many people, their own income is not growing as fast as their debt is growing because of the interest rate. And what that means is that they become more and more debt burden. Now, up until Roman law, debt cancellation was the rule. Now, exactly how frequently do you cancel debt varied across societies. Judaic society, the Judaic Bible, it's every seven years. In Babylonia, apparently, it was either 30 years or with the death of the emperor and the rise of a new emperor, you would start all over again. So, it depend on how long their lives were, <laughs> or 30 years if they did not die sooner. But with Roman law, we got property law that protects the owners who obviously don't like debt cancellation. So ever since then, we have protected the creditors and we eliminated debt cancellation, substituting bankruptcy, which is not nearly as good as debt forgiveness. And so we have a problem of debt burdens that tend to grow over time and become unpayable debts. In fact, you've just reminded me, I will link to our episodes on the organization the Debt Collective, who came out of Occupy Wall Street. You may have heard of them, Randy. They started off as an organization called Rolling Jubilee. And so they were a fund. They raised funds and then bought debt on the secondary market, student debt and medical debt, and just canceled it. And I thought that was a good teaching tool to show people, okay, this is what money is. Money is debt, as you say, Randy, but then also great activism. That reminds me of David Grever's book and this whole idea as well behind the history of money being really about kind of the conflict between debtors and creditors. 
and how also much, obviously much later than these societies that you're discussing came this obsession with fixing the value of money because any kind of discrepancy in the value of money, inflation in particular, would be immoral <laughs> in the sense that it would be repaying less to the creditors than you initially agreed to. And obviously there's a big theme. There's a word that keeps repeating in your book, Randy, your latest book, Alleluia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time to describe the redemption, the cancelling of debts, or the, like you said, the literal redemption in the monetary sense that we were talking about earlier. So bringing it back to the here and now though, the press are reporting this week that the Bank of England are about to launch a four-month consultation on a digital pound, nicknamed Britcoin. And I was struck by this sentence in your book, the nature of money doesn't really change when the recording technology changes. And you touched on it a few beats ago, but could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, today, most of our record keeping is digital. And so we're not using tally sticks anymore. <laughs> we're not using clay tablets. And the number of transactions in cash is extremely infinitesimally small. And young people don't even know how to write a check. So they don't do that. And so it's almost all digital already. It's strange to me that people think that this is a really new thing that central banks might decide to have digital coins instead of physical coins, since, again, it's just record keeping. I think that moving to a system in which everybody has an account at the central bank and the, say, the technology, the privacy questions, and just the management of, in the case of the United States, maybe 350 million accounts at the Fed. Those are things that, that need to be discussed. But digital coins is no big deal at all. I think what a lot of people pushing this are concerned with is that crypto has been sold as a possible replacement money, including for cash payments. And I see crypto as really very little more than just fraud, a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme, whatever you want to call it. I think that is a huge problem. In the United States, Gary Gensler is cracking down on it. And I think that's very important that we need to stop these fraudsters from separating people from their wealth. It's just another scam. Now, probably a lot of your listeners are not going to like what I just said, but that's the way I see crypto. I think we agree, don't we, Christian? Absolutely, yeah. And I think a lot of our listeners do. I, I know that some listeners are, okay, central banks get things wrong, so it would be great if there was no government intervention anywhere in the money system. But I, as I've said before, complaining about money being political, it's like complaining about water being wet. <laughs> But anyway, so then there's the privacy issue. And the good thing about using government cash is that there's a lot of privacy involved. That's also the bad thing about it because it can finance a lot of undesired illegal activity. And so that's a tough question. Society might be better off if we didn't have a way for people to hide their payments. But I think that needs to be discussed seriously. I know there's the claim that, well, they can use modern techniques to keep everything anonymous, even if the accounts are with the central bank. But we do know that the governments are pretty good at getting information that they want. I think the issue of privacy is quite important, particularly here. I mean, in the UK, people rally up against the very idea of an ID, the existence of one, and th the belief that there has to be a way of making transactions without anonymity <laughs> is accepted as the right thing over here. But the issue is that with cash, at least, and cash would have been the way to do that. But with cash, it's very difficult to do that on a large scale. Whereas with a digital pound, if it was anonymous, then you could potentially open up opportunity for fraud on a large scale. So would you then say that cash and uh, physical cash should always be retained as an option, even if it does remain in very little use as a means of allowing those small transactions to be carried out as people 
preferring anonymity if they wish. Yes, I definitely lean that way. And I think we should keep the denominations of cash low because that makes it difficult to do the large ones. And I think the large ones are the problem. The small cash payments, there could be under the table work and things like that so that you don't report taxes is illegal and it's not desirable, but the bigger problem is the huge cash payments. So keep the denomination small and allow people to have some privacy in small payments, but not allow privacy in the large payments. I think that's really the crux of the issue that we have to look out for, why the story's worth paying attention to, whether or not the government is going to try and ban cash. As far as I can see, I can't see the circumstances where that will come about. Now, I know we sometimes go to shops where they go, hey, we're completely cash free. You have to tap your card or use your phone. I don't think that's the government driving that. I just I think the government wants to have cash as much as private citizens do. I don't know what anybody else thinks. There's one other big issue that does support the use of government, central bank, digital money. And that is that we have a large part of the population in the United States that is unbanked. They don't have bank accounts because of the fees, possibly because they're in rural areas, in Indian reservations, for example, where they don't have banks close by. So I do think that we need an alternative to the private banking system and uh, to cash to allow people to have free banking accounts so they can make payments, so they can accumulate savings and so on. And an alternative to using the central banks for this is to go back to the postal savings systems, which many countries had. We had a postal savings system in the United States till the mid 60s. There are post offices all over the place in the United States and Trump <laughs> tried to close a lot of them down. But um, Americans really like their post offices. And so we can use those for banking. And they can provide a lot of the services that the unbanked part of the population needs. And I think that's probably a better alternative to trying to have an account for everybody at the central bank. Over here, the post office it does provide some banking services, but not serving the government, but serving some smaller kind of commercial banks that don't have offices, branches or things that people can visit. So they pay a fee to the post office and the post office accepts payments or deposits on their behalf. But the other thing is during the pandemic, we had this kind of transfer payments to people and a lot of people were unreachable because of what you were saying, Randy, that they didn't have bank accounts. This certainly would fix that problem, wouldn't it? Yes. So I think a free payment system that's an alternative to the for-profit banking payment system is a really good idea. And we know how to do it. We used to do it. And the Japanese Postal Savings Bank was the biggest bank in the world. I'm not sure if that's still true. So the models are out there for us to study and it's easy enough to do that. So back to the book and turning the corner. In the next chapter of the book, which is entitled, Where Does Money Come From?, you write, to put it simply, the central bank lends government money into existence while the treasury spends into existence. Remember it this way, the central bank lends, the treasury spends. Could you say more about that? So a lot of people get confused over what central banks and treasuries do. And the discussion around the pandemic didn't help because a lot of pundits were saying, oh, well, the central bank is flying helicopters and dropping money into the economy. And so that just confused the issues. So treasuries spent the pandemic relief money into existence. The central bank is the bank for the treasury. So the way that treasury spending actually gets paid for is that the central bank will credit the reserves of your private bank and your private bank credits your deposit. I think the majority of the payments in the US were electronic, so that's exactly how it occurred. On the other hand, you might have gotten a check in the mail from the treasury, so it's a treasury's check, and you take it to your bank, you deposit it, they credit your demand deposit, and they send it on to the Fed, in the case of the United States, Bank of England and Britain, 
and the central bank credits the bank's reserves. That's how the treasury spends. Now, the central bank is involved in it, but they are just acting as the bank making the payments for the treasury, just like your bank will make payments for you. You can write a check to your landlord and your bank will make the payment for you. So there's nothing strange about this. The treasury has a bank, you have a bank, and the Fed acts as a bank when it makes payments for the treasury. The central banks also do what we call monetary policy. And that is different from what I was just talking about, which is called fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is spending and taxing, okay? The central bank is involved in both of those, but that is a treasury operation. The central banks do what we call monetary policy. And in monetary policy, central banks lend reserves to the banks that need them to make payments basically to each other. That is how the Bank of America, in case your listeners don't know, Bank of America is a private bank in the United States. It has America in the name and actually was founded by Italians in California, but it is not a national bank. It's a private bank. So if Bank of America receives a check drawn on Chase Bank, Chase Bank will pay Bank of America using its reserves at the Fed. The Fed will debit the Chase Bank and credit the Bank of America reserves. That's how payments are made between banks. And then finally, banks also use their reserves when they make payments to the Treasury. So when you pay your taxes, the central bank will reduce your bank's reserves. So that's what reserves are used for. The reserves have to get into the banks so that they can use them. They can't create those. Those are only created by the central bank. And the central bank can provide reserves to them in one of two ways. One is they can just lend them. They just lend the reserves. And so a listener might say, well, where do they get the reserves to lend? They create them. <laughs> they use a keystroke on the computer to credit their deposit account at the central bank. So it's just created out of thin air, you could say. They lend those reserves to the bank that needs them to make a payment either to the treasury for taxes or to clear checks with some other bank. The other way that they can provide reserves is by buying something. Because when the central bank buys something, it creates reserves to pay for it. The main thing that they buy is government bonds. So the central bank will buy a treasury bond from a bank in order to put reserves into that bank's reserve account. So my guideline was to think of central banks lending, not spending. They can lend the reserves directly or they can provide reserves by buying bonds. This might sound like spending, but economists don't count that as spending because it is not a purchase that will go into GDP, gross domestic product. All it is, is the purchase of an asset that is just exchanging one kind of asset for another kind of asset, exchanging reserves for a government bond. We don't call that spending. It's a monetary policy operation. So that's the other way that they can get in to the economy. So with that said, you also add a caveat in the book, a minor exception to our rule that central banks lend and treasury spend is that central banks do buy a limited range of financial assets, but these purchases are undertaken to implement monetary policy, not to move resources to the government sector, which is what fiscal policy is largely about. Now, that's what you were just talking about, as I understand it, Randy. Yeah, that's right. So their operating policy is to buy assets to put reserves in. This has nothing to do with fiscal policy. So following on from that, I think it's in the same area, but this might just be a UK thing, but as part of the Bank of England's quantitative easing program, on top of buying government bonds with reserves, or as we say in MMT, swapping interest-bearing pounds for non-interest-bearing pounds, the Bank of England also bought high-quality commercial bonds. I wondered if you knew what their reasoning was for that 
because it confused a lot of people. How is that supposed to work in monetary policy terms? They were not alone. Oh. The ECB did it, right. the Fed did it, and the Bank of Japan did it. It's called quantitative easing. I would just say whatever they, and I mean all of those central banks, whatever they thought they were doing, it was bad policy. They'll say that they needed to provide liquidity to the system or some such thing. But if the system needed liquidity, that is more reserves, the central bank ought to just lend them at the discount window. The discount window, it's an old, it's a historic term, but that's lending reserves by the central bank to a private bank. One of the goals of quantitative easing was to get the interest rates down. Okay, because we had just gone through the global financial crisis, the economies were rotten, and the idea was if we can get the interest rate down really low, people will start spending and we'll get out of this recession. Okay, so it's some kind of logic to that. But you don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of private bonds. We're talking about trillions of dollars, yen, pounds, and euros. Many, many trillions were purchased by central banks. They didn't need to do that at all to lower interest rates. All they have to do is say, well, we think the 30-year treasury bond interest rate ought to fall to 2.5%. And what we're going to do is stand ready to buy enough treasury bonds to get that interest rate down to 2.5%. Okay. Now, are they going to have to buy any? The answer is no. Because no market participant is going to doubt that they can do that, okay? So the price of bonds will move such that, and again, this would have to go deeply into financial theory. We don't need to do it. The price of 30-year bonds would have to move to the price that gives you an interest rate of 2.5%. It'll go there immediately. Betting against central banks is the dumbest thing you can do. Because they have an unlimited purchasing power to buy government bonds. They will never run out of reserves. They can always buy them. So they're going to get the interest rate that they want. But for some reason, they thought they needed to go out and buy bonds. Okay. They also started buying private bonds. So mortgage backed securities, for example. And that was to get private interest rates down really low too. Again, they could have done the same thing, although uh, I'm not so convinced that this would have been a good policy. And I also suspect a little bit the Bank of England's claim that they're buying high quality commercial bonds. I doubted that the Fed was buying high quality mortgage backed securities. So what if they're doing is, buying low quality ones that have some probability of default, what they really are doing is bailing out parts of the private sector. And I think that they probably were doing that. It's corporate welfare. It's that and it's very bad policy. Okay. People should have taken losses. They took great risks and there was lots of fraud involved uh, and they should have lost. So they should not have been bailed out. So I think the whole thing was misguided, at least, and possibly, you know, an underhanded way to ensure that people who had undertaken great risks didn't suffer the consequences. And now that obviously the QE period has ended, and I think, well, the UK certainly, but I think even the US has started quantitative tightening. Can you explain maybe? what the purpose of quantitative tightening is? Is there any real point or is it simply sort of them trying to pretend that things work in a certain way? What's the uh, logic behind it? So I don't think quantitative easing really eased anything. And I don't think quantitative tightening really tightens anything. Raising interest rates has impacts and they are raising interest rates, and we are seeing the impacts of that. I don't think that this is a precise tool at all. It's like a sledgehammer, and you're not quite sure if you're doing good or bad <laughs> with the sledgehammer. So I don't think that it's the right policy to be raising rates now. But anyway, raising rates is one thing, and it has impacts. But 
quantitative tightening really doesn't. I think there's just a general belief that we don't want central banks to maintain these huge balance sheets forever. The quantity of reserves in the United States used to be some number like 50 billion, and it, it went up to trillions, okay? Well, that is the central bank's liability. They, it's offset on the asset side by trillions of stuff that they bought, government bonds and private bonds. And so the idea is this just is abnormal for central banks to have such big balance sheets. And they've wanted to try to shrink them. And in the United States, we've had some what are called taper tantrums. So taper means reducing the size of the Fed's balance sheet. And when the Fed tried to do it, the market reacted and interest rates went up temporarily in sort of a little tantrum. And I really don't know why. And I don't think anyone really knows why. The markets want to keep tremendous amounts of reserves in the banks. I don't know the answer to that. I know that there is an excellent, probably the best financial journalist right now writing a book on it. The author just asked me what I thought. And I told him, you know, boy, I hope you can figure this out because I can't. So for most of the first decade or so of your work on money, it was all about the private money system, as I read it in your latest book, and how bank credit is created when banks make loans. And for people who come to the banking system through MMT, this concept of loans creating deposits, known as the endogenous money view, can sometimes be a bit of a stumbling block. And I think there's a confusion where some people think that commercial bank credit is side by side with central bank credit rather than central bank credit being at the top of a hierarchy and commercial bank credit being below it, as you talked about earlier, Randy. So if we start with that primary MMT money story with a government needing to provision itself, and so it imposes tax liabilities on the private sector denominated in its own money of account, which only it can create, and then that leads to people needing to sell goods and services to get the government's money to pay taxes with, and that gives us our tax-driven state issue currency. What might be a way to integrate commercial banks into that story? First, there's the historical question, which came first, private banks or government and its money? And the answer on that is very clear. <laughs> authorities, governments, originally probably religious authorities is where money started. There are sort of bank-like things that go way back in time. Modern commercial banking only goes back a few hundred years. So, I mean, the historical story is that definitely government money comes first and that bank money comes later. Are banks at the same level in that pyramid as a central bank? Well, clearly, no, they are not. The banks use the central bank's liabilities to clear with each other. So they are below the central bank. They need the central bank to do the clearing. The first two central banks in the world were created in first Sweden and then in England. And that was at the end of the 17th century. In the United States, we didn't get our central bank until 1913. We had a very backward financial system. Of course, we had a treasury and we had a treasury currency of different kinds over the years. We did experiment with a Bank of the U.S. twice, but it was politically unpopular in certain ways. But anyway, because we didn't have a central bank like Britain did, we had the worst financial history of any of the countries that became developed capitalist countries. Because our banks had nothing to stand behind them to ensure that bank money issued by Bank of America would clear at par against Chase Bank. At par means dollar for dollar. A $1 check from Bank of America, it has the same value as a $1 check from Chase. Now, actually, until the late 19th century, banks mostly issued notes rather than checking accounts. So if you took out a loan, they actually printed up the note. So they would look just like the a five pound note in Britain or the one dollar note in the United States. But instead of saying Federal Reserve note, which is what our currency today says, it would say Bank of America note. Those notes 
did not circulate at par. And when you started to suspect that your bank was in trouble, that maybe it had made a lot of bad loans and that it couldn't convert its own notes to U.S. Treasury notes at par, we would get a bank run. And so every generation, we had the equivalent of the global financial crisis in the United States, but with no central bank. And so the banks would fail and or shut their doors. In Britain, the Bank of England existed, again, since the late 17th century. And by the early 19th century, well, no, sorry, say more like 1840, the Bank of England had realized what it could do to stop bank runs. And that is to lend its own notes to the banks facing runs. That would stop the bank run and prevent a financial crisis. So Britain could stop bank runs. The United States could not. Our Fed was created specifically to provide reserves to prevent bank runs. Now, they didn't do it in the Great Depression. We had bank runs anyway. But there, the problem was that the Fed didn't think it should lend reserves to banks that were insolvent. It should only lend reserves to banks that were solvent, but they were facing an irrational run, like the Jimmy Stewart Savings Bank in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. So anyway, his bank was solvent. In other words, he had the assets, but the assets, as he, he tells the crowd that's trying to get their cash out, the assets are the homes that he had financed with mortgages, and he couldn't get that money back quickly. He would have to foreclose on everybody's homes. So anyway, the Fed didn't really do the job in the Great Depression, but the lender of last resort is what it's called. Principle was understood from the mid-19th century, and all the developed country central banks act as lenders of last resort in order to stop bank runs. Our financial crises now occur generally outside the banks. It's in what we call the shadow banking sector. So we still get financial crises and they can be extremely severe like they were in the global financial crisis, but generally they're not in the banks. As a result of the failure of the Fed to prevent the deep financial crisis in the Great Depression, where half of all the banks failed and closed up and depositors lost their money, we created deposit insurance. So this is the treasury that promises to make good your deposits, even if your bank fails. So we put that in place. And so in the United States, we haven't had any bank runs on FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, insured banks since the Great Depression. So it works absolutely. We have had runs on banks that didn't have FDIC insurance, but we don't have any of those anymore. In in Britain, your listeners will remember, you did have a run during the global financial crisis. That's because you only had 90% insurance. <laughs> and the feeling was, well, that'll be good enough to prevent a run, but depositors are rational. Do you want to lose 10% of your deposit? The answer is no. <laughs> and so there was a run on, on the bank to try to get the funds out because nobody wanted to lose 10%. And after that, Britain and several other European countries had to do the same thing. They had to raise it to 100%. So as long as you are below the upper limit, which in the US was raised, I think, to $400,000, you can't lose with an insured deposit at all. So that deposit insurance adds another layer of protection so that even if your bank has done the craziest kind of lending and engaged in massive fraud, which is what they did before the global financial crisis, you can't lose your deposits. So that is in addition to the lender of last resort, that makes the banks perfectly safe but I still wouldn't put them at the top of the pyramid because they rely on Fed money to clear their own accounts. They can't clear accounts using their own money. And that puts them below the Fed in the way that I view things. Some people might say that sort of 
decreases the incentive for banks to actually be run responsibly. Would you agree with that? Well, that is true. But we've done several other things that reduce their responsibility. If you go back to, say, before the mid-19th century, banks in England, the owners of the banks were liable for double their investment in the bank. So if you had invested, say, £100,000 in the bank, you were liable for £200,000 if the bank failed. That gave you a pretty good incentive to make sure the bank was doing safe things. Well, modern banks are corporations with limited liability. So the owners have nothing but their investment at risk. You can't go after their wealth. So we already reduced the incentive when we did that, when we allowed limited liability. The argument was, well, then you can increase your ability to raise capital because many more people will be willing to buy bank shares if the only thing they can lose is their investment. They can't lose their own wealth, all right? But that reduces the incentive for the banks to keep risk low. Adding the lender of last resort reduces the incentive to maintain liquid positions. Adding the deposit insurance reduces the incentive for the depositors to make sure the banks don't engage in risky behavior. But the reality is the depositors can't possibly discipline the banks anyway for two reasons. One, banking is very complex. And... <laughs> The typical depositor can't possibly understand what the banks are doing. And the second reason is there are privacy considerations. So the banks can't tell them who and how much they have lent. So you couldn't get the information, even if you had the capacity to evaluate the credit worthiness of the bank, you can't get the data. So it's just not conceivable that the owners or the depositors of the bank can properly regulate and supervise what the banks do. That is why this has to be done by the government. You have to have the government regulators. In the United States, so the Fed is a regulator, the Treasury is a regulator through the FDIC, so the Treasury is the insurer of the banks, they have the right to regulate them. Also the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, regulates the banks. And then the individual states regulate their banks. So we have a number of levels of regulation. And I would say they do a pretty good job with the small banks. They do a terrible job with the big banks. And then on top of that, if they try to do a good job in regulating a big bank, the big bank has donated campaign money to very important senators and House members, and they will call on them to attack the regulators. And th this is not, I'm not saying anything hypothetical. <laughs> this is all the way things actually work. You can read the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One by my UMKC colleague, Bill Black. Laid it all out. He was a regulator, and the owner of one of the banks that he was regulating actually put out a hit on him. So uh, just getting the senators to uh, attack him, they were called the Keating Five. Five senators were bought by this guy to tell the regulators to leave him alone. That wasn't enough. They actually put out a hit on him. There is a huge problem with the big banks. So one is their political power, and the other is the complexity of what they do. They have maybe thousands of offices all over the world, and they engage in extremely complex financial transactions that are hard to keep track of. So they are a huge problem, and I think there is one obvious answer to that, which is we should not have big banks. Either limit their size or just nationalize them? Yeah, I think that there is a role for national banks, public banks, state development banks. So that's a good alternative for some kinds of financial activities. And then beyond that, yeah, break them up, have a maximum size. But also Eric Tamoyne, uh, he had a very good proposal, which is regulate them like we regulate 
dangerous drugs. Now, dangerous banks are much more dangerous than dangerous drugs. Dangerous banks kill far more people than dangerous drugs they've ever killed. So there's a legitimate reason to do it. But regulate them like dangerous drugs, you have to get approval before you can do it. Now, that's not the way that we operate now. We let them do whatever they want to do, and then we decide later, well, have they killed too many people? <laughs> Should we outlaw that practice? That's not the way to do it. They force them to get approval first and really look into it. And uh, then if you find out, well, that was a mistake, we shouldn't allow them to do it, then, then yes, take it away. So we tell them what to do as opposed to tell them what they cannot do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not against all kinds of bank innovations. So a bank innovates a new product. Okay. Just like drug companies come up with a new drug. Okay, fine. Let's take to the FDA, uh, in the case of drugs in the United States, and get approval. The FDA does tests and decides whether it's safe enough to release. Do the same thing with financial products. Let them innovate all they want, but they have to have approval before they can use them. So this is obviously why understanding the system is important, because you've got to understand it to see these things. And so the full title of your book, Randy, is Making Money Work for Us, How MMT Can Save America. But of course, we'd also like to save the world. And the good news about that is that your chapter that you co-wrote with Yeva Nassissian in the brand new Gower Initiative book, MMT, Key Insights Leading Thinkers, that chapter pushes back on this well-worn canard that MMT only applies to the US because the US issue the world's reserve currency. And you lay out why that's wrong and why MMT applies to all currency issuing nations. Could you talk about that? Yeah. Let me first say that this is why the argument is that we want to make money work for us. Okay. And so I actually didn't come up with a subtitle. Publishers do that. Of course, I don't want to limit it to America. But let me say, money gives you power. So the sovereign government issues money and issues the money that's at the very top of the pyramid. And that gives them the power to do both good and bad. They can use that money to move resources in their favor. Hopefully in a democracy, they're going to use that power to do good. That's what democratic authorities are supposed to do. They're supposed to represent our interests to serve the public purpose. Now, they've been failing us. It's not all their fault. Reagan in the United States, Thatcher in Britain, turned people against the government. And we've greatly weakened their ability to serve us. That is a huge problem. And so I think it, it's important to say, that we need to turn this around and we need to recognize that we can use government to serve the public interest. Okay, now turning to this frequent and false criticism that MMT only applies to the United States, maybe Britain, maybe Japan, and so on, and MMT just ignores the developing world. Well, that's not true. It is true that United States economists have played a big role in developing MMT. And a lot of the work has been focused on the United States because we know the United States. But obviously, Bill Mitchell is not from the United States. He's a, from a small country. Now, it's not a developing country. It's a rich country. But in, in many ways, it, it faces some kinds of problems that smaller developing countries face. It's an exporter of commodities, like a lot of developing countries are. So I think it, it was never a fair criticism anyway. And now we have more people who are explicitly applying MMT to developing countries. So I don't think it ever was a fair criticism. But anyway, turning to the paper with Yeva, what we argue is all countries face resource constraints. So we have that in common. That's true of the United States, too. As long as the government issues its own currency and doesn't issue debt in foreign currency, then we would argue that the sovereign government is not financially constrained, whether it's the United States or Australia, Britain, or a developing country. It doesn't face a financial constraint. It does have self-imposed constraints, 
Uh, for example, typically we all formulate a budget that's approved by the elected representatives and then in the case of the United States, signed by the president. And countries have all adopted operating procedures that guide what the central bank and treasury can do or cannot do. So they have those kinds of constraints. The reality is that most nations don't live up to their resource capacity. And I would include the United States plus developing countries. We're all in that same boat. We face resource constraints, but we don't even operate the economy up to those resource constraints. In the case of developing countries, what they typically do is mistake balance of payment constraints for resource constraints. And that is why they operate their economies with substantial slack, that is unused resources, especially labor resources, because they fear this balance of payment constraint. And they allow the current account position to constrain their government balance. So they're very worried about running a current account deficit. The balance of payment deficit is feared, and rightly so, to have exchange rate effects. So in other words, if you persistently import more than you can export, that can have an effect on your exchange rate. Your currency will depreciate against the dollar. And so to some degree, you could argue austerity that is trying to reduce government spending to slow down economic growth, to slow down growth of income so that your population doesn't buy as many imports, allowing your trade imbalance, trade deficit to decline. That might be a reasonable thing to do. But there are alternatives to that. You could Instead, restrict imports, put a limit on the imports, and prioritize what you should import. In other words, don't import luxury goods, import food for the population. So you could try to reduce your imports, not by depressing income and causing unemployment, but by choosing to import what you really need and uh, restrict imports that you don't really need. You also can use import substitution. There's nothing new here. This is in all of the heterodox literature that you try to grow your own food rather than importing food. So Fidel Kabub has been arguing this, that that should be your top priority because typically the poorest countries are importing food. So you can greatly reduce your current account deficit if you can increase the production of food. There is this perception, at least in Peru and possibly the rest of Latin America, that your development is very much tied in to your ability to obtain dollars. So prioritizing uh, obtaining dollars, uh, maximizing exports is seen as the key to development. And of course, that's been the policy over the last few decades. And if anything, our economies have become less varied and more specialized than we used to be. Yeah. So to a degree, the poorer countries have to exchange real exports for real imports. The reason is because the rest of the world doesn't want to hold assets denominated in their currency. For the United States and for Australia and for Britain, this isn't true. All of us can easily run current account deficits. We can import a lot more than we export. Because the rest of the world wants to hold assets denominated in our currencies. So we're not constrained by the amount of real stuff we can export. In a sense, what we export is assets. We allow the rest of the world to own financial assets in pounds or dollars. And we can run current account deficits with no predictable impact on our exchange rate. As Alan Greenspan said, we don't have a model that can tell us what determines the dollar exchange rate. And that's because the vast majority of transactions, I think John Harvey said that it's 98% of all dollar transactions around the world are in assets, not in goods and services. So it's not in traded stuff. You might hold a US treasury bond because you know that it's an extremely safe asset. You're not speculating. You're just going to have a return that you can count on. 
Now, there's lots of speculation. There's lots of hedging, exchange rate risk, interest rate risk. Those are two of the biggest kinds of derivatives out there. But even those, you wouldn't necessarily have to say that it's speculation. You may want to protect yourself from exchange rate movements. And so you can buy various kinds of financial products. But yes, there's a lot of speculation. It's not all speculation, but there's a lot of it. So anyway, the developing world, generally, there isn't a big demand for financial assets denominated in their currency. And so for them, they do need to export real stuff and they need to develop the capacity to export. Now, international charity should play a much bigger role. The typical problem for a developing country is foreigners don't want assets denominated in their currency, so they really can't borrow in their own currency. They got to get hold of dollars to buy the imports they need to try to develop their economy. And I think that's what you were saying about Ecuador. And the problem is that the interest rate is likely going to be above their growth rate. And what that means is their debt is going to grow faster than their capacity to pay. Their debt burden is going to increase over time. They are going to get into what Hyman Minsky called a Ponzi position where they're going to have to borrow to pay the interest, the dollar interest that they owe, which means their debt is going to grow even faster, okay? It's very hard to develop this way, very difficult. And of course, the creditors like that just fine because the real stuff is flowing to them. Yes, the creditor nation. So they probably don't see it as like, oh, something's going really wrong in this system. Right. And at least on paper, the debt is growing. And so the asset they're holding is is growing over time. Now, of course, we know what happens. We get defaults. We get serial defaults among the highly indebted developing world. And as I said, from Roman times on, we generally don't cancel the debts. And so they default. And unlike in the case of, say, a business default, you know, Trump can go bankrupt many times and he walks away from it and he's perfectly fine. We don't have international bankruptcy laws that apply to nations. And so Argentina defaults and one of its naval ships is seized, right? We don't have a way to deal with those defaults. Sometimes there's some kind of debt relief, but it's on a one-by-one case and it's a a haphazard thing and it keeps poor nations in poverty. So we need an alternative. Borrowing dollars to develop is, for most countries, is not a path to success. Instead, we should have international charity. We not lending, but support for developing nations. So making money work for us, how can MMT save the world? A big agenda. But the point is, the U.S. can't run out of dollars. We can ship an unlimited supply of dollars to any country in the world that needs dollars for development. Unfortunately, our leaders don't see it that way. So we have international agreements on how much aid each country should give relative to its GDP, right, to the developing world. The U.S. consistently doesn't live up to its promises. Why? Well, we're running out of money. President Obama told us that. He said, you know, we we would love to spend more, but we ran out of money. Well, this is false. We cannot run out. If Ecuador needs dollars in order to develop its economy, We can't run out of dollars to give them. Now, what can we run out of? The same thing every country can run out of. Resources. The real stuff. We can't run out of dollars, but we can run out of the real stuff. So the question is, if we sent the dollars to Ecuador, and Ecuador wanted to buy machinery or whatever it is to develop their capacity to take care of their own population, the question is, could the U.S. produce the real stuff that they need? And right now, the answer is pretty clear that we can. In spite of all this worry about inflation and, oh, the labor market is too hot and so on, we remain on a downward trend in terms of capacity utilization. When the economy did well in the past, we would be up in the 80%, above 80, say 85% of capacity. Over the past 30 years or so, Our peaks have declined to now we're in the mid-70s 
That means we have 25% unused capacity. And the growth of capacity has been depressed because we have excess capacity. When firms already have more capacity than they can use, they're not really inclined to produce more capacity. So what I'm saying is that we have excess capacity now already, and we could ramp up investment, which is part of Biden's Build Back Better plan. Which got translated into the Inflation Reduction Act. He couldn't sell it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't want to build back better. What a bad idea that <laughs> you is. You want to reduce inflation. <laughs> but fighting inflation, okay, yeah, we want to do that. But anyway, so there is some money there for infrastructure development and for investment. And so my point is that we can grow our capacity, and I think we can meet the demand of developing nations. And so there is no reason not to ship them the dollars that they need, and it should be charity, not loans. So I think that understanding how money works does help us to resolve those problems. They do face real resource constraints, and they face constraints in terms of the external demand for their currency. What they don't face is a constraint in the internal demand for their currency, okay? So at the same time, that the United States and other rich countries are helping them to develop, they need to utilize all of their domestic resources. And they don't need our currency for that. They've got their own currency. So they should be using their own currency to mobilize all of their domestic resources. And they have the capacity to do that. They can't run out of their own currency. I don't know if you travel to Latin American countries. I've gone to a number of them. And the first thing that is obvious is that the reported unemployment rates mean nothing. The actual unemployment rate is usually well above 50%. Okay, people are working, washing windshields at the stoplights and so on, and five people helping you park your car. Okay, those people could all be put to work doing useful things. And so I, I don't want to completely let them off the hook either. So we should do our part which is providing the dollars they need. And they should be doing their part, which is employing all of their population and trying to develop their economy. I think that's much preferable to the two kinds of strategies that they've been forced to adopt right now, which is either you borrow dollars and you get an unpayable debt, or you sell off your natural resources and devastate your environment. Those are the two things that a lot of the developing world are doing now. And that's not in their long-term interest. It doesn't increase their capacity to take care of their own people. So I think both of those strategies are failures. I think part of the reason why unemployment rates are quite meaningless is because of the degree of informality usually in these economies it makes it really difficult to monitor what the economy is actually doing. Yes. And there's no reason to have this huge informal sector because they have their own currency. They can mobilize them and formalize all of the work with a job guarantee. Which is a whole other episode. <laughs> so moving into the home straight, at the end of one of your lectures from a few years ago that's out there online, which I really liked, you rounded it off by saying, let me tell you what I didn't say in this talk. <laughs> and then you list and correct a lot of the common misconceptions about MMT, which I thought was a great way to drive your actual points home. And if you were to do that now, what would you say is the biggest misconception about MMT right now? Yeah, it's really funny how after I give a talk, people have heard things I never said. And so they, they well, you said, well, no, actually, I never said anything like that. Anyway, the biggest one now after the pandemic and after the global financial crisis, when governments ramped up their spending and central banks really ramped up their quantitative easing, buying assets, people said, oh, well, now they're doing MMT. It's helicopter money. The central bank is printing up money and sending out relief checks to everybody in the case of the pandemic and flying helicopters around. That's MMT. But that's not MMT at all. So they saw MMT, I think. So I'm trying to interpret what they meant. They saw MMT as arguing that we should change the way the government spends. Rather than having the treasury spend, we should have the central bank do the spending. 
And so the treasury wouldn't need tax revenue and wouldn't need to borrow dollars. The central bank would just print up the dollars and spend them for the treasury. That's MMT. Well, no part of that is MMT. So first, we've actually, for the most part, we don't recommend changing any of the procedures. What we do is we describe the way things work right now. And we say, and it's perfectly adequate. The procedures we already have are perfectly adequate to allow the government to spend more on things like the Green New Deal, on pandemic relief, on a job guarantee. We can do all of those things with the current operating procedures. No changes required whatsoever. All we need is for Congress, in the case of the United States, to approve more spending. That's all it takes. Once it's approved, the Treasury and Fed know how to do it. They don't need to change any part of their procedure. Okay. Now, it's true, some MMT people have recommended getting rid of Treasury bonds. Okay. That doesn't really significantly change the procedures. So, right now, when the Fed makes a payment for the Treasury, it credits a bank's reserves and the bank credits the deposit account of the recipient. We generally then sell a bond to drain those reserves out of the banks. Before 2009, the Fed had to do that because otherwise, the overnight interest rate, which in the United States called the Fed funds rate, most countries call it the bank rate, that will drop to zero if there are excess reserves in the banking system because you'll have banks wanting to lend reserves but no bank wants to borrow reserves because they're all in the same situation. They've all got more reserves than they need. So the bid will drop to a zero and the interest rate will be zero. And in normal times, the Fed doesn't want a zero interest rate. So it will sell bonds to take the excess reserves out. Beginning in 2009, the Fed was allowed to pay interest on reserves. So now the interest rate can only go down to the interest rate the Fed is paying on reserves. That becomes the floor rate. So all the Fed has to do is raise that floor rate to whatever it wants the interest rate to be, and it will never drop below that. We don't need the bond sales anymore. So eliminating the bond sales would have no impact on the Fed's ability to make interest payments. It has no impact on the Treasury's ability to continue to spend because the Fed can continue to credit bank reserves, okay? So it doesn't really change anything that's very important. The only question is whether you think that there's a role for bonds to play in the economy other than keeping the interest rate above zero. Maybe there is. I think that there could be. Do we want at least some entities in the private sector to be able to hold a perfectly safe government bond and earn interest. But wouldn't that role be filled by reserves now? No, because only banks can hold reserves, okay? So if you're a pension fund, pension funds like to hold some government bonds as their safe asset, and then they can buy some risky bonds to get a higher return, okay? So to raise their average return above what government bonds can make. Household savers generally don't like a lot of risk, but they want to get some interest. And so, should we allow savers to hold some U.S. savings bonds? When I was a kid, we would take a quarter to school, and they had this little envelope with slots. You put the quarter in, and when you got eighteen seventy-five, uh, you could exchange that for a U.S. savings bond worth twenty-five dollars seven years later. And so we saved that way. Do we want to allow that? to promote private saving in a perfectly safe asset, and importantly, at an interest rate that public policy chooses? I think the answer is yes. Rather than forcing people to take risks with Wall Street, let's give them a safe alternative. Let them save, and we give them a good interest rate. Why? Well, because Uncle Sam can afford it. <laughs> He's not going to run out of money. Let's give him a good interest rate. Let them save in U.S. savings bonds. So I still see a role for government bonds to play in the economy. Maybe it's a much reduced role compared to what it is now. 
Maybe it would be, we put an income limit so you can't buy these things if your income's above $50,000 or something like that. And only pension funds, not other kind of shadow banking entities would be allowed to buy them. So I would leave that open. And obviously, it's a democracy. So Congress would decide who would be allowed to purchase these things and what the interest rate would be. But anyway, getting back to the main topic. The other thing I don't like is saying that the pandemic relief was MMT policy. And that is just false. Even I very explicitly, I think it was in March, the pandemic had just hit. We laid out a strategy, an MMT strategy for dealing with a crisis. And there were no helicopters in that strategy. There were no relief checks to be mailed to everybody in that strategy. That was not MMT strategy. We warned that mailing checks to everyone was a bad idea and could be inflationary. It was being sold as a stimulus. We said, we don't need a stimulus. The supply side has collapsed. The last thing on earth we need is to stimulate demand when there's no supply. So it was not an MMT policy. We wanted targeted spending. And in fact, MMT has always argued for targeted spending, has never argued for what's called pump priming, just indiscriminate pumping up aggregate demand. We have never advocated that. That could easily be inflationary, even if you're not at full employment, because you're not targeting the spending where it's needed. So you will get bottlenecks. You will get demand exceeding supply in parts of your economy. So that's a very bad policy. It's not an MMT policy. And of course, the MMT policy prescription being the job guarantee, and I'll link to our episodes about that in the show notes for this episode. And there's so much more to talk about from your book, Randy. And uh, speaking for me and Patricia, we would love to talk for hours, but we know that time is finite. So we'll have to leave it there for now. So we've been speaking with Professor L. Randall Ray, Principal Architect of Literally MMT Itself, and now author of a fantastic new general audience book, Making Money Work for Us, How MMT Can Save America, and co-author of the more in-depth academic collaboration, Modern Monetary Theory, Key Insights, Leading Thinkers. Both of those books are essential reading, so we'll link to where you can get hold of them in the show notes for this episode. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today on the MMT Podcast, Professor L. Randall Ray. Thanks a lot. It was fun. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at MMT Podcast at Outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.